then other people, they are sleeping and have all these nightmares. <laughs> they can't come. Yeah, I guess we should start. Okay, let's start. Let's start? Please. What do you think, huh? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much. I definitely appreciate you waking up so early just to come to my class. <laughs> and I really appreciate all of you who forced me yesterday to get into my dancing stuff. It was really fun. I enjoyed so much. Uh, the only problem was that I was, I can hardly walk. <laughs> <coughs> so let's see. The worst case scenario, I had a, a plan B. I will sit here in the big chair <laughs> and we will talk. But let's start and hopefully it will be okay. <coughs> so, um, what I want to keep going and talk today is about flavor physics. And what we did yesterday, we defined the standard model. Oh, let me, let me ask you a wake-up wake up question in the morning. So what is the symmetry group? OK. I know it's an easy question. In, always, in the morning, you have to ask easy questions, like, how are you? OK. <laughs> okay. So you won, why? OK, and then we have the, the fermions. They have a very cute name, you remember? They're all there. It's called the QDEL. The QDEL. And then we gave them some number, and then there was one Higgs. <coughs> and there's three of the QDELs. And then we basically, what we did, we follow our procedure. We write the, the Lagrangian, the most general one, and we start expanding, and we looked into the coupling, uh, interaction that the standard model has, and we have the following interaction. We have the interaction of the photon and the gluon. The interaction are <coughs> diagonal and universal and parity invariant, so they are proportional to either E for, for the photon or G strong for the gluon, and they parity invariant. And then we talked about, we, we didn't talk about the coupling of the Higgs. I'm just telling you that the Higgs coupling is also universal and universal. Universal. Let me say I should have said universal means diagonal, but with the same value of the coupling. Well, diagonal means that things are, there's no off-diagonal off term. There's no, like, UC coupling, but the, the coupling is not the same. So that's the difference between universal and diagonal. So the Higgs coupling is proportional to the mass of the fermion, and... <coughs> It's diagonal, but not universal. It's proportional to the mass of the fermion, so the heavier fermion couples stronger to the Higgs. And then we show the coupling to the Z. We kind of did it, and we find that the coupling of the Z is <coughs> proportional to T3 minus Q sine of square theta W. And it's p-violating, and it's universal. That is, for all the quarks that are, for all the down-type left-handed left quarks, you have the same value here. However, it's not the same for left-handed and right-handed, and we can see it through the T3, because left-handed field, the T3 is either plus or minus half, while for right-handed field, this T3 is zero. So we see that we have p-violation. And then we talked about the W, which we spend most of the time Yesterday, and we find that the part of the W is proportional to something like QI, VIJ, DJ, such that this V is the CKM matrix. Okay? And then we learn how to count, and we found that the CKM has four parameters, three angles, and one phase. And we also find that the, the W couple only to left-handed. Okay? Very good. And then we went on and discussed the structure of the CKM, and we find that the structure of the CKM is very roughly one lambda, lambda cubed, lambda one, lambda squared, lambda cubed, lambda squared one. <coughs> and one thing that I didn't actually discuss yesterday, and I should have, is I didn't tell you what are the masses of the quarks, okay? So I make a big deal about the fact that the CKM doesn't look like a, like a generic matrix. It looks like they have a structure. It's very close to the unit matrix. But I didn't talk about the mass of the quarks. And the mass of the quarks are 
the mass of the uptype quarks are roughly 5 MeV, 144 GeV, and 174 GeV. That's the U, U, C, and T. And for the downtime quark, it is roughly 9 MeV, 100 MeV, and 4.2 MeV. And that will be the D, S, and B. And one thing that we see here is that actually also the quarks, the masses of the quarks are not generic. They're not generic in the form that you see there's a very big hierarchy between them. <coughs> and we don't know what to expect. If, you just, if I tell you, give me six numbers, I expect you to give me six numbers that are distributed evenly. And somehow I feel, you see here that they are very, very different, okay? Here we have five MeV, one GeV, <coughs> almost a factor of 1,000, and almost 200 GeV. So that's another factor of 100, okay? And in the down quark, there's a factor of 10 here, and another factor of maybe 100 or something like this, okay? So you see that we have this really non-generic structure for the masses of the quarks, okay? Yes? 4.2 GeV. GeV. Thank you. Aye, aye. Anything else that I missed? <laughs> but actually, <clears throat> before I go on, let's, let's actually discuss a little bit. How do we even can talk about masses of the quarks? Does it make sense to talk about the mass of the quarks? Okay, so let, you have three options. You have to say, yeah. <clears throat> does it make sense? You should say yes, no, or it depends. How many people vote for yes? Nobody. Ah, nobody. Nobody. Yes. Okay, if one person who thinks it makes sense. You should have said it makes sense because I'm writing them. So I wouldn't write it if it wouldn't make any sense, right? How many civilians say it's, it's totally garbage? I learned it. I, I actually, when, when I was in the UK, <laughs> in the flight to the UK, the, the flight attendant, she said, rubbish. You know the difference? And I said, oh, in America they say garbage. And she said, garbage is such, ah, rubbish, it's such a nice word. <laughs> anyway, so <clears throat> how many things that it depends? Good, okay, that's very nice because that's, usually that's the, the answer to everything. It depends, it's kind of a good answer. Okay, so what does it really mean to talk about the quarks, the, the, <coughs> the masses of the quarks? It doesn't make a lot of sense in the following sense that when we think about the mass of the electron, how do we measure the mass of the electron? We take the electron to infinity, we isolate it, and we measure the mass. And the idea is that we measure the mass because when it goes to infinity, there's no interaction, and actually all the energy can be attributed to the mass. However, we cannot really measure the mass of the electron if the electron is part of a bound state, because then you have to take into account the binding energy, and you cannot say, oh, that's binding energy, and that's the mass of the electron. Right? And we know that the mass of the hydrogen atom, for example, is less than the mass of the proton plus the mass of electron by 13.6 electron volt, which is the ionization energy of the hydrogen atom. Okay? But for the hydrogen atom, we say, yes, I know what to do. I take my hydrogen atom, take the electron to infinity, which is like one centimeter away, and take my proton away, and I measure the mass. Okay? But for quarks, I cannot do it. Why I cannot do it? Why I cannot take my quarks away? Because of confinement. So what do I really mean by measuring the mass of the quarks? Moreover, I even told you that the, at the infrared, there's no meaning to talking about quarks. Quarks only exist at the UV. So if something only exists at the UV, clearly I cannot take it to infinity and measure the mass. Therefore, ma quarks only exist when there are actually a lot of interaction around them. Okay? So why are you still talking about the mass of the quarks? Okay? So one way to go, which I like to think about when I think about quark masses, is that it just represents some result of some experiment. And that's the way we do physics. We do one experiment, and using the result of one experiment, we can make prediction in the other experiment. So that's just some parameterization of the result of one experiment, and using this parameterization, I can use it in another experiment. Okay? And that's, for me, the best way to think about it. Another way to think about it is I say, yes, masses runs, just like any coupling in, in the in nature, like we talked about the fact that the coupling, the electromagnetic couplings run, also the mass runs. The measurement of the mass depends on the scale that you are doing it. 
Now, usually, when we measure the mass of the electron, we mean the scale is, is zero. We measure the mass of the electron when it's far away, so there's no scale associated with it. When we measure quark masses, we measure them at a scale that is very high, because we want to measure them at a scale far away from the confinement. Okay? So these masses were measured at 2 GeV, except the mass of the heavy quark that were measured at their mass. So the mass of the top was measured at the energy of the top. And the mass of the B was measured at the energy of the B. But for the U, C, D, and S, it was measured at 2 GeV. So we want to understand that these masses are the mass at 2 GeV. And these masses at 2 GeV basically have nothing to do with the mass, the way we think about mass in the usual sense that, you know, you have particle with a mass and it's a react to gravity and all this. It's just a parameter in our Lagrangian that we can measure. Yes? So I, I'm not going to get into too much details of actually how we do those measurements. And let me say one more thing that you will not be surprised that these masses are totally depend on your regularization scheme. So these are MS bar masses. And then you can define another regularization scheme, some HD, HD bar, pole masses, and you get different answers. Okay? So they are totally unphysical. Okay? And the way we measure them, so the mass of the bead, there's so many ways to measure it, and it depends. You can take the upsilon, the upsilon is a BB bar bound state, and divide by two and define this as to be the mass, or you can actually look for some resonances. There's many ways. As I said, the important thing is that you understand how you take one measurement and apply it to another measurement. Okay? But at the end of the day, what we learn, and that's what I wanted to say, is that we see here there's also very non-trivial structure. Okay? And one way that kind of, if I, if I tell you that I just randomly generated number and I look onto this number, I said, oh, if instead of generate the number, I generate the log of the number, then they maybe look a little bit uh, distributing randomly. Okay? So maybe the physics is not in the masses, but somehow the log of the mass is where the physics is. So people write some model, they try to take the physics into the log, and the many of those exist, but we don't know if they are what, what, you know, how, how much physics there are in those. <coughs> but one other thing to mention is that both the CKM and the masses are related to the Yukawa matrices, right? Because these are the, they are the eigenvalue of the Yukawa times the VEV, and these are, they are related to the mixing angles of the Yukawa, the mismatch between the two Yukawas, right? And one thing that actually comes naturally is that if you, have a if you have a matrix, and let, let me back up a second. Three by three matrices are so much more complicated than two by two. But two by two, by that stage of your career, you should really have all the intuition of two by two. You look at a two by two matrix, and immediately you kind of understand what's going on. So in a two by two matrices, OK, I want to ask you the following question. What is the relation between the, generally, for a generic matrix, if you have very different eigenvalue, what is the, <coughs> in general, the mixing angle? And the answer is that in general, when I have a matrix of the following, something like, <coughs> Eps, let's, let's do it like 0, epsilon, epsilon 1. OK? You look into this matrix. What is your intuition? Very quickly, what are the eigenvalues? Roughly, very roughly. That was a wake-up call. <laughs> <laughs> you all have to know when you see this. OK. We talked about it yesterday, like during the dance, but because of the noise, nobody heard me. <laughs> so I wanted to explain. The to first order, you look at this, to first order, how it looks like. Zero and one, because epsilon is small. So to zero's order, you say the, the, it's, it's diagonal. So to leading order, the, <coughs> the eigenvalues are zero and one. And then you say, well, but it's not really zero because the determinant, what is the determinant of this is epsilon squared. And the determinant is a product of the two eigenvalues. So you say, since one of the eigenvalues is one and the determinant is epsilon squared, the eigenvalue should be epsilon squared and one. OK? Another way to look at it, you say the trace is one and the determinant is epsilon squared. So I have a sum of two numbers is one. The product is epsilon squared, so it should be one and epsilon squared, roughly speaking. OK? So I say the it's epsilon square and one. Do you, do you see it? It's all those things that we should just kind of get used to. And what is the mixing angle? What is the mixing angle that takes to diagonalize this? 
I know it's early in the morning. I know. I wake up before you guys, I promise. I was preparing the lecture, okay? Since, sun, since, since sunrise. The first sunrise come to my room, I wake up into FCNCs, okay? So, <coughs> how do we, what is the mixing angle here? You should do it, you should do it, yes? Epsilon, very nice. You see that this is epsilon away from diagonal? You see it? Yes, so it's epsilon. And actually, there's some, this, uh, uh, the formula tells us that tangent to theta is equal, let's, let's write it like this. A, no, let's leave it. For a generic matrix, A, B, C, C, okay? Tangent beta is 2C over A minus B, okay? So those are formulas that you just need to remember, okay? So you kind of get the intuition, and in particular where C is much smaller than A over B, you get that theta is equal to C over A minus B. So in this case, theta is equal to, theta is about epsilon, okay? So one thing I want to say is the following thing. When you have hierarchy, when you have hierarchy of eigenvalues, it's come very naturally with small mixing angle. That's a general statement. It's not a, a theorem. There are examples that violate this idea. But the generic feeling is that large hierarchy in the eigenvalues come together with very small mixing angles. That's the general statement. And that's what we see in the CKM and the quark masses. We see hierarchy of masses come together with small mixing angle. Okay? So somehow what we conclude is that somehow there must be some hierarchy in the Yukawa. Okay? So the Yukawa is not generic, and the fact that the Yukawa is not generic gives us this kind of structure. Okay. <coughs> so that's basically just kind of, wow, wow. 15 minutes, and I already review what I was saying yesterday. So let me go on. <clears throat> and before I go on, I want to touch upon some, it's almost vocabulary, but when we start doing flavor physics, we start using meson and hadrons. And what I find out that many times, just remembering the names of the hadron and what really they mean, it's a little hard, so I want to very quickly review and remind ourselves what are those uh, hadrons, and I know that many of you know it very well, but let me just remind you. So when we, <coughs> what we are talking about now, I want to kind of review what we have at low energy QCD. What's happened for the, yes? So actually I found all six to be out of place, okay? And that's really the important thing. There's nothing in the structure altogether that tells you it's interesting. And one way to look at, into those, and again, it's become semi-philosophical. I said, I expect the Yukawa to be order one, and therefore there's only one that is in place, which is the top, and the other five are not in place, okay? But then usually you say, well, you know, we kind of say the majority is what we call them, used to it, and then this looks like exception. So it's, it's, very, it's kind of philosophical. But the point is that you see some structure, and it's interesting, and people spend a lot of time thinking about why there is. Okay, so I want to talk about the structure of low energy QCD. And we talked about the fact that we have confinement. And then when we have confinement, what emerge are a set of hadrons. And we distinguish between two kinds of hadrons. Which we, we distinguish between what we call resonances, a resonance, and a stable, and a stable meson, okay? And in the PDG, if you don't know if something is a resonance or no, a resonance appears with a number in parentheses. For example, when you open the PDG, you see something like this, okay? Or you can see something like this. So what does it mean? What does it mean, row 770? Row 770 means that I have a resonance with a mass at 770 MeV. And this resonance, the, we call it resonance because it could decay via QCD interaction. It's decayed by emitting a pion. This is something that QCD allowed it to happen. And the widths of those resonances are very, <coughs> are very, very, <coughs> very big, okay? The widths of the row, anybody? I know it's some trivia, but maybe yesterday after the dance, you opened the PDG. Anybody after the dance opened the PDG? Nobody, yeah? <laughs> Just me. I couldn't fall asleep, so I opened the PDG. <laughs> so the, the width of the row is like 150 MeV. It's a very large width. 
150 MeV, it's about a quarter factor of a quarter or third than the mass. Okay, that's the meaning of a resonance, that it's very, very wide. Okay? And what is a stable particle? A stable particle in the PDG appears without a number. For example, a K or a B or a D, which are actually all the ones that we care about, or a pi. <coughs> and they, their width is ex it's much, much, much smaller than those. Okay? So the width of the K is about 18 order of magnitude smaller than the width of the row. And in the standard model, we understand it the following. QCD tells us that those uh, mesons are stable. Why? Because they are made of the, they are the lightest, uh, they are the, the ground state of QCD with these specific uh, quarks. And it's only the weak interaction that makes this quark to decay. Okay? Now, the name is a little bit misleading because we say it's a stable particle, but the B, for example, the B have a lifetime of a picosecond. So picosecond is not very stable in everyday life, right? And the kaon, have a, depending on which kaon, have a lifetime of order 10 to the minus 8 second. It's not very stable. But it's stable compared to those ones, okay? It's much, 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 decay much slower than this one. So when we talk about the weak interaction, and when I care about the weak interaction of the quarks, all I care about is the weak interaction of those mesons, okay? So those resonances to leading order, when we do flavor physics, you don't care about them. Okay, of course, we care about them at some point, but to leading order, we care about those quarks, on, those mesons only. Okay? So when I try actually to do measurements and understand how I actually measure the interaction of the quarks, all I have to do is to look into the equivalent of the mesons. And now comes the big question, and that's the huge question. And the question is, how do I know that I deal with this uh, crazy QCD bound state? How I related this crazy QCD bound state to the quarks? Okay? So the way we do it, we use what we call the quark model. And the quark model is just a model. It's not based on any truly fundamental theory. But <clears throat> it's still we have quite a lot going on with it. But we use the quark model, and we say the quark model tells us what quarks make us those mesons. Okay? So for example, the kion is made out of someone. Someone tell me what the k is made out of. Let me do k plus. A K plus made out of, it's made out of an S bar and a U. You see that the charge of the S bar and the U add up to be a charge of plus one. And this one has a strange quantum number of minus one, and that's, that's what we, or plus one, that, that's what we have for the K plus, okay? So we say the K plus is made out of S bar and a U. It's a very complicated bound state. That doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about it as, 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 as a bound state of two quarks. But what I care about is that it has the quantum number of these things. Okay? In under QCD, it has one S quantum number and one non-S quantum number. So then this K on decay. And this K on decay, for example, not for example, most of the time this K on decay too. Any, anybody? Sorry? To pions. And <clears throat> to pions? Anybody? Nobody opened the PDG? What the K, the K plus decay to? So the K short decay to pi on. The K short decay into two, into two pi, that's basically 100% of the time. Okay? So the K short decay to pi is 100% of the K plus decay to what? Sorry? Yes, exactly. Which leptons? Very specifically. No. Muon and, and a neutrino. Wow, you really, we really need to go over those basic uh, PDG stuff. Open the PDG, please. Okay? Today, you have some time. Go to the beach. Take your PDG with you and start looking on those decades. And so, actually, a K plus decay to muon and a neutrino 64% 64, 64 of the time. So about two-thirds of the time, a K plus decay into a muon. Okay, it's a, a huge number. Anyway, <clears throat> the point is as following. What I try to make is as following. How do I actually make the connection between the K on decay and the parameter in the Lagrangian? The parameter in the Lagrangian is the one that actually corresponds to this uh, 
VUS, because if this, this diagram in the standard model, what, what's happened is that I have an S that decay into a U, emit a W, and the W go to the muon and the neutrino. So this is the diagram that I have in the standard model for S decay. And the question, how this diagram of S decay is related to the decay of the K plus, OK? And you would say, well, I really know how to calculate decay of free particles. How do I know it? Because I study QFT, because people did it forever. And I know how to de a decay of a free quark decay, OK? And then when you study quantum field theory, not if you just the very basic, even in this little what I was telling you about quantum field theory, we say the way we are doing it, we think about a harmonic oscillator that decay. But a harmonic oscillator just have, you know, there's just, just a kinetic term, so it's a free particle. So we really know how, to f how free particles decay. But this S, it's bounded inside a kaon, and not only that it's bounded inside the kaon, I was telling you there's like no way to even think about it as, a, as an S quark. It's just some complicated ground bound state of QCD. So how do I relate to this complicated bound state of QCD that happen to have the same quantum number, the same kind of interaction as a, an S by an AU, into the decay that I'm really after, which is this diagram, OK? So you see the question. The question is as following. When I do weak interaction of quarks, what decays are hadrons. And what I want to measure are decay of free quarks. But free quarks do not exist when I look at mesons. So the question is how I do relate the decay of the hadrons into the decay of the free quarks. This question is understood? Good. And so there's actually many ways to go. And one way is to do QCD parametrization, which is a very, uh, very important method. This method is called parameterize our ignorance. Okay? When you don't know something, what you do, you kind of uh, look around and say, that's I know, that's I don't, that's I know, until you really, really know what you don't know. Okay? So you parameterize what you don't know. So here I was just telling you a big deal. I said, how do I relate quarks to mesons? Okay? But then you can actually do some algebra based on Lorentz invariance, based on, on some isospin, based on whatever other symmetries you have, until you come and say, that's exactly what I don't know. So for example, when I look at k plus going to mu nu, you can actually do those little trick until you say there's only one number that I don't know. And this one number is called the k on decay constant, f sub k. OK? So that's very nice. You take something that you don't know, and you work on it until you say the output is something else that you don't know. OK? So you made a lot of progress, right? You take something that you don't know, and there's something that you don't know. And then at the end of the day, there's one number that you don't know, for example, the k on decay constant. And then you spend a lot of time trying to actually calculate it. And for example, this specific number, the, decay, the k on decay constant, is now calculated on the lattice to amazingly good precision. OK? So sometimes you can actually use the lattice to get those numbers. Sometimes you can use some models to get those numbers. And sometimes you are smart enough to actually find some observable that this number cancel in some ratio. And then you can still get some intuition about those kind of things. OK? And I want to emphasize the following. I think most of my physics career was developed to this one specific question, OK? I, I think more than half of my papers are related exactly to this question. And that's the question, how we overcome QCD in order to get sensitivity to the weak interaction, OK? And this is an extremely important question. And we do not have a simple answer. We have a lot of little tricks, but there's no one big idea. When we do quantum field theory, we have one big idea, which is perturbation theory and Feynman diagram. So we do perturbation theory and Feynman diagram, and that basically solves almost all that we need to do in QFT. When we come to this specific question of how we probe the quarks within, uh, and we have QCD, this question is not very simple, and there's a lot of little tricks that we are using, OK? And not only me, many people asking this question. However, I'm not going to talk much about it, although I really like those kind of subjects. I want to go on. So to leading order, the answer is as following. To leading order, you look into some decay of mesons. You write them as decay of quarks. You write the Feynman diagram of the quarks. And you say, 
There's also some QCD that someone can take care of, and at this moment, let's not worry about it. And that's a very good approach to don't think about QCD as of now. It will come back later, but at the level of this course, at the level of the introduction, don't worry. And later on, hopefully, some of you are excited enough. And I know some of you already work on such things, and you ask the question of QCD. OK? So when we ask, how do I measure v VUS, I measure VUS by looking of this decay. OK? And if I ask you, how would I measure VCD? Ah, VCB. How would I measure VCB? Can someone give me a decay that will be so? Oh, I should have said. Everybody see that this is proportional to VUS, right? I have here VUS. So if I measure the, the rate of this process, I can measure VUS. I can extract VUS from this measurement. That's what I have in mind. So how would I get sensitivity to VCB? Yes? So which one is heavier, the C or the B? The B. So the B is heavier than the C. The C is 1.4 GeV and the B is 4.2. And <clears throat> then I should actually look for a B decay. And a B decay to what? To something that have a C, and that's a D. A D meson, and then something like MU nu. So if you look into this, the diagram, the B, the B meson is made out of a D and a B bar. And it can decay, say, to a, <coughs> let's do like this. I have a B plus. A B plus is, uh, it's a B bar and a U. That's a B plus. And the B, the B bar is decaying to a C bar <coughs> and a muon and a neutrino. OK? And this one is proponent to VCB. So to leading order to get sensitivity to VCB, I look for something like a B meson decay into a D meson decay, and then I have to worry about QCD, and a huge amount go into it until at the end we believe that we kind of understand everything that, no, mostly what's going on, and we get VCB. Good? We, we good with uh, our understanding of how we actually do those kind of things, okay? Yes? Good. So now, yes. So <coughs> I'm not going to discuss much, but the question is experimentally, how do we actually know that I have a B meson and a D meson? So <coughs> the point is that in order to actually see those, the way we know that we have a B meson is once we measure the mass of the B meson, we kind of reconstruct it. OK? It depends if you are working in an E plus collider or in a hadron collider. And when you look at the D, you decay in the decay product of the D. For example, the D many times decay into a K pi, a K plus, say, a K plus pi minus. And then you reconstruct the K on and the pi on, and you look for the invariant mass of the K and the pi, and you understand that you have a D, and you also have a muon, and you can reconstruct the energy of the mu for in an E plus E minus, for example, you can reconstruct the energy of the neutrino. So, in order to actually fully do this kind of measurement, you have to look at the total part of the event, okay? So I'm not going to discuss too much. But the point is that, yes, it's not a trivial measurement, and you have to look how those particles decay. And kind of to give you the feeling, <coughs> actually, yeah. So the, the lifetime of the, of the B meson is about 1.6 picosecond, and the lifetime of the D depend which D is between uh, 0.4 to 1 picosecond, or the D0 and the D+. plus. So one, one picosecond, with, even with a large boost, is no more than a few microns at most. Okay? So they really decay at the very, very beginning of our uh, detector. They're not going into the outside of the detector. What's really go outside of the detector is basically the kions and the pions. And the kion have a lifetime of, it, of something like 10,000 more than the B. So you see just kion and pions going into your whatever calorimeter and everything. OK, so what I want to do next, I want to <coughs> open the PDG. And you think I was joking that I said that last time when I couldn't do anything, I was opening the PDG. So I did. And I did the following thing. I, yes. How do I get the CKM element and the decay constant? 
No, 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 no. So again, what you are really measuring, at the end of the day, you are measuring some combination of some QCD factors that could be a decay constant, or in this case, something else that called form factors. So you, you always measure CKM times the form factor, OK? And then you have to use all those smart ideas how to actually get the form factor and separate those two, OK? And then you use things like heavy quark symmetry, <coughs> Lorentz invariance, lattice, a lot of things you put together until you kind of believe that you kind of understand well enough the form factors. And there's always this worry that you don't really understand what you are doing because it's QCD, OK? But as I said, it's a huge topic that I spend a lot of time in, but I don't want to get into it. The point is that that's, that's really the question that we are dealing with, but I'm kind of going around it and I'm telling you some result without getting into the interesting part. So I opened the PDG and I look into some uh, <coughs> decay, so I measure some decay rate and I want to do the following exercise. When just based on the measurement, I want you to stare at these measurements and tell me what kind of a structure do you see emerging, okay? So I'm doing, I was looking into the following one, B going to D, muon neutrino, and the branching ratio is two times two times 10 to the minus two. Then I did <coughs> B plus going to pi, pi muon neutrino, and the branching ratio is 1.5 times 10 to the minus four. And then I look for B plus going to K plus mu plus mu minus, and the branching ratio is 4.4 times 10 to the minus seven. Then I start doing D meson decay. I was very effective, and I was, it was K mu ni, and I found that this is 3.3 .3 times 10 to the minus two, and I did D going to K, D going to pi mu on neutrino, pi mu nu, and that was 2.4 times 10 to the minus three, uh, and then I did K plus going to mu nu and that's sixty four percent and then I did K plus <coughs> going to not K plus K long going to mu plus mu minus and that's seven times ten to the minus nine. Oh and I forgot I also did D going to pi mu plus mu minus, and that's the bound that is less than seven times 10 to the minus eight. Okay? So I just throw some number on the blackboard. And I want you to stare on, I, one thing I should say, I didn't actually talk about K long and K short. So the K, the neutral K is actually mixed, and we're going to talk about it, <coughs> I think, tomorrow. They mix and the mass eigenset are called K long and K short. But to leading order, you can forget about all these subtleties. What I told you is that this one you can think about uh, S decay and also here is the S D decay. Okay? But I want you to stare at this uh, on those numbers. Experimental measurements, huge effort got into doing all those measurements. <laughs> and I'm just asking you, what kind of pattern do you see? Do you see some specific pattern? And I want you to make some conclusion about this pattern. Stare, stare. Let's do the usual one that we required for a minute. So I'll be quiet for a minute, talk to your neighbor, talk to people and say, what do you see from those numbers, okay? And if you don't see one number, let me know, I will make it uh, bigger. Okay? Try to see, talk to your neighbor and say, what do, what do we see here? There's not too many numbers here. I, I put eight numbers on the board. Please talk to your neighbors, see what you can conclude about these numbers.
Okay. <clears throat> so, can someone tell me, like, yes? So one very important result is the following thing. is the fact that when we see that we have a pair of charged leptons in the final state, here, here, and here, the decay rate is much, much smaller than the decay rate when I have a, a pair that is one charge and one neutral. So the mu nu final state is much, much, much more likely to appear than a pair of muons. You see, for B physics, it's something 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 7. In D physics, it's from 10 to the minus 2 to less than 10 to the minus 8. We don't know how much. And in Keon physics, it's from 1 to 10 to the minus 8. So here's 8 order of magnitude. Here is 5 order of magnitude. Here is at least 6 order of magnitude. OK? So just looking at the data, we make this following very interesting conclusion, that somehow, in nature, decay into a when the lepton final state is charged, the combination has charge one, the decay rate is much, much bigger to decay where the combination of the lepton is zero, the charge of the lepton is zero, okay? And I'm going to discuss it in a second. These decays are called flavor-changing charge current, and these are flavor-changing neutral current. Let me, probably I should explain it right now. These are flavor-changing neutral current because you see that the change, the flavor of the quarks is changed in a way that the charge of the flavor doesn't. Okay, so if I look for B plus, B plus that go to K plus, what's happened here? A B plus is a B by U, and a K plus is an S by U. So you see that the B become an S. So the quarks change from a B to an S. The quark change from one to another quark that has the same charge. That's called FCNC. FCNC, flavor change in neutral current. Very important acronym. You really need to know it. FCNC, it's so important. And then we look, for example, for B plus decay into a D plus, and a B plus decay into a D plus, it's BU, and it's decay into a C. C. Uh, I messed it up. Okay. Decay into a C bar and a U. Okay? So this is the B plus going to a D, D0 bar, OK? And what we see here, we see that we have a B going into a C. Here we have a B going into a S. That's flavor changing neutral current. This one is flavor changing charge current. This one is FCCC, flavor changing charge current. So you see here the flavor of the quark change such that one quark went to another quark with a different charge. And here the quark, the flavor change such that the New quarks have the same charge as the decaying one. And here the decayed quarks have a charge that is different. And what we found, conclusion number one, conclusion number one is that FCCC is much, much larger than FCNC. Okay? And the fact that FC and C are so small is a very important for our understanding of, of what's going on. That was conclusion number one. Conclusion number two. What other thing you can actually get just from staring at the number? TKM. So <laughs> you're totally right. But what I like to do, I like to actually look at the number and just tell something about those. And then we interpret them. I didn't actually interpret this result yet. And we're going to interpret in terms of. So can you interpret this result in terms of, without saying the name CKM? What do you really see? Yes? You, you kind of know the answer from the standard model. I want you to just get it from the numbers. So what you are actually saying is the following. The transition from, first, from 3 to 2 is much bigger than from 3 to 1. Yes? B to D is much bigger than B to pi. And here, D to K is much bigger than D to pi. So what we see here, here we see that 3 to 2 is bigger than 3 to 1. And here we see that 2 to 2 is much bigger than 2 to 1. OK? So what we conclude, that's the point number two that you can get from the data, is that 3 to 2 is much larger than 3 to 1. And 2 to 2 
is much larger than 2 to 1. Okay, you see just that based on the data? Yes? And I want to say this is a very generic result. It doesn't really very important the exact number. You just see this structure, okay? Factors of hundreds and tens and millions, okay? So these two conclusions are just, you just look at the data and you see this, these patterns, okay? Are you with me? Yes? So I, <coughs> yes. Oh, the generation, sorry. I, so the third generation quark into two generated quark, the width of three generation into two generation is much bigger than the third generation quark decay into a first generation quark. And here, a second generation quark into a second generation quark, so this will be C2S is much louder than C2, C2D. And here, that B2C is much larger than B2U. Okay? That's what I mean. <coughs> So what I will ask you to do, I don't, we don't have any more like homework session, but try to do for homework is do the measurement that is open the PDG, and believe me, you know, we are not asking too much. These experimentalists works for years. The people spend all their life to make one measurement, and all I ask you to do is to open the PDG, and you're gonna do it. I mean, give them some respect, okay? They work so hard just for you to open and see the number, okay? So open, look at the number of the, of the PDG, and find actually more of those. Just look at the PDG, stare at the PDG, and try to think about other decays where we should see the similar pattern. And what you're gonna find out that no matter where you look at the PDG, these patterns always emerge. It's always the same thing, okay? These two properties are always there, okay? So what I wanna say is the following, so far, I was just telling you some theoretical stuff, and I kind of mentioned experimental data, but now I came to this thing that you just look at the data, and you stare at the data, and you see so much in the data, and what I want to do is like, from this data, actually say how good is the standard model picture of CKM that we were just talking about, okay? So I actually like to do, a <coughs> to go the other way than before. So before I was just doing, doing like, telling you about the story and tell you that the CKM has some structure, and I want to go the other way around. I actually look at the data and I say how these two things are explained in the standard model, okay? So you already know the standard model, and I'm asking you what are the fundamental things that happen inside the standard model that give us this kind of structure, okay? So can someone tell me that within the standard model, how the standard model explains the fact that FCCC is much larger than FCNC? How the standard model explains it? Yes. Yes. And the double, so the point is as following. Flavor changing charge current is mediated at three levels in the standard model. Flavor changing neutral current is forbidden at three level in the standard model. You mentioned the Z, but actually, in the beginning of the lecture, I was careful enough to write all the other mesons, the, the gluon, the photon, the Higgs, and the Z, all of them are diagonal. So to leading order, to a three level, we have only this. And we all know the three level is much bigger than one loop, okay? By how much? By how much a one loop is suppressed? Yes, it's one loop is one over 16 pi squared, which is roughly 100, okay? So we're expected here to be a factor of 100. But actually the numbers are much bigger than 100, okay? So we kind of understand some, do you see what I'm saying? So the difference between this and this is five order of magnitude, okay? And we expect it to be 100, maybe if we square it, maybe 1,000 maybe at 10,000, but it's not such a big number. And here, it's huge. Here, we have eight order of magnitude, and we expect it to be less. So what I'm going to actually discuss soon is why this suppression is much more than one loop. The suppression of flavor changing neutral current in the standard model, you gave me the leading order result, which is that it's three level versus one loop, and soon I'm going to actually tell you that there's actually more suppression of the flavor changing neutral current, as we see from the data. And if you like, to do a bit more precise, we see that the FCNC in the B meson is less suppressed than FCNC 
in the, in the current sector, the FCNC is more suppressed than the B. So also this we're going to understand when we actually do a little more digging into the standard model. But this is the result that FCNC is much bigger than FCNC, okay? How the standard model explains a point number two, which you already kind of told me before I was actually making point number two, is the CKM. Okay? So now let me ask you the following question. Which of those, those properties, are there generic? Are they there in any standard model, in a standard model? Or are they there only in the standard model, the one that we actually measure in nature? So I'm asking you about those two things. Are they there in a generic standard model or only in our standard model? Someone, yes? Which one is generic? So this one is generic because three level versus uh, one loop is generic to the standard model without measuring any parameter. This one is very specific to the structure of the CKM. Okay? And what I'm going to show you next is actually that the extra suppression that we see, and I will tell I just told you that there's extra suppression. This extra suppression is also unique to our standard model. Okay? So this fact is actually part of it is generic and part of it is unique. And this one is only in our standard model, OK? So one thing that we learn when we do flavor physics, unlike what we do when we do like uh, Higgs physics and those kind of things, that there in, in flavor physics, there's a lot that depends on the fact that our standard model is kind of different, OK? <coughs> Very good. So <coughs> what I want to do now is to talk a little more about flavor chain unital current. And I really like to emphasize that the concept of flavor chain unital current is an extremely important concept in physics, okay? And you always have to kind of, when you think about physics and <coughs> models beyond the standard model, you have to think about flavor chain unital current. It's a very big deal of what's going on, okay? So what I want to ask is the following question, is what is really the reason or the deep reason that we don't have flavor chain neutral current in the at three level, and then we are going to do it at one loop, and we're going to see how come that we have this extra suppression, okay? So let's see what is the fundamental ingredient that doesn't make, that guarantee that we don't have FCNC at three level. L let me back up. I want you to understand that when people propose the standard model, they know about this data and they actually build the standard model so that we have to make sure that FCNC is not there. So they built it in a way to make sure there's no FCNC at three level. And what I want you to understand is what are the tools or the model building tools that one can use in order to make sure there's no FCNC. And you may use those tools when you do a model building beyond the standard model because whenever you do model building beyond the standard model, you also want to make sure there's no FCNC because if there are large FCNC, it's contradict the data, okay? So there's four bosons, the gluon, the photon, the Higgs, and the Z. And <laughs> there's some different fundamental reasons of why we don't have FCNC in, in, in both of them, in all of them. So let me start with the gluon and the photon. So why the gluon and the photon do not have FCNC? Anybody have any intuition? Why the FC, why does, well, let me ask the following question. Can you think that you can build a BSM model where you have photon FCNC? Based on the way I asked the question, what do you think the answer is? So, so can, I, can, I build a, can I build a new physics model with the photon couple to an S and a D? Is there a way for me to think about some BSM model that give me this vertex? No, very nice, perfect answer. Why? Yes, why? No, actually, it's, it's, it's not important, it's not the clarity. Okay, let me, let me kind of back up 
and come back to the big picture, okay? So the big picture is like this. When something is forbidden, why it is forbidden? Because of? Century. So I asked you, can I do it? And you said no. So it is forbidden because of? Because of a symmetry. That's what I want. If something is forbidden, it's because of a symmetry. And I ask you, can we do it? And you say no. And I said, that's correct. No, so there's a symmetry. So now I want you to be very precise and say, which symmetry forbid photon go to SNAD at tree level? So there's a tree level coupling. And there's a symmetry that guarantees that this one cannot happen at tree level. What's the name of this symmetry? Gate symmetry. Which gate symmetry? Electromagnetism. The gate symmetry guarantee that the massless gauge boson must diagonal, must couple in a diagonal and universal way. And you can actually prove it with some formal ways, but the intuition is that when you have a non-broken symmetry, the kinetic term is still just the d mu of the unbroken generators. So this one, the coupling of the photon, come together with the kinetic term, come together with the derivative. And the derivative is always diagonal and universal. It's always canonical. That's the meaning of being in the canonical basis. That's the meaning that we understand how things propagate in time. So gauge symmetry guarantee that we cannot have this. OK, that's gauge symmetry. And that's very important because once in a while, you have someone, a friend, a student, someone who has some new physics model, and they do calculation. And they said, wow, look, I have a very cool result. My photon coupled to an SNDD. And they come to me and say, look, it's very cool. And I said, you are wrong. I said, how do you, do you know? And I said, because there's a symmetry. He said, but look, it's, I did everything. I said, you were wrong. And then they go back, and indeed, they were wrong, OK? Because there's a symmetry. So you have to remember, there's a symmetry that guarantee photon and gluon are diagonal. <clears throat> so here it's kind of easy. You don't need to work hard in order to make sure. The Higgs and the Z is a little different. So why the Higgs? What is the fundamental story of the Higgs? Why the Higgs couple diagonally to the, to the quarks? Let me ask it differently. Can I have a theory where the, when I have a Higgs that's coupled to TNC at tree level? So this Higgs is the physical Higgs. It's not the, the, the field. It's not the field, it's the physical particle. So can I have a BSA model where I have some kind of a Higgs, maybe not our Higgs, but some relative of the Higgs, or even our Higgs, that couple a tree level at TNC? So I, it's a yes, no question. Can we find a new physics model where I have a Higgs coupled to TC? Okay, there's some kind of uh, mixed reaction within the crowd. Okay, and the answer is yes. And if you like, the answer is yes because there's no symmetry that guarantee it. Okay, here there's a symmetry, and here there's no symmetry. Okay, so let me explain what's really going on in the standard model. Why the standard model have the, the Higgs coupled diagonally, and then we understand how fragile is this condition, how easy it is to actually break this condition. Okay. So the reason that the Higgs couple diagonally is the following thing. We write the Yukawa interaction. So let's take the Yukawa, say, for the downtype quark, yq d phi, OK? And then I take this phi and I expand this phi. So instead of phi, I write, uh, maybe I should write it up there. Um, So instead of phi, I write V plus H, where H is a field, OK? And then I have YQ, YQD, V plus H. And then what I do in order to move to the mass basis, in order to move to the mass basis, I diagonalize Y. And when I diagonalize Y, automatically also the coupling of the Higgs is diagonal, because you see they are proportional to the same thing, OK? Do you see it? It's the fact that the reason that the Higgs have no FC and C coupling at tree level is because it's the same matrix that gives me the coupling and the masses. So when I diagonalize the Yukawa, when I diagonalize the mass and I move to the mass basis, I automatically diagonalize the coupling of the Higgs. You see this? 
So now can you think about an example where this is not the case? Can you think of an example where the coupling of the Higgs is not diagonal in the same basis that the mass is diagonal? Yes? So the model from yesterday? The model from yesterday, that's a very good example. And actually, in my original question, this was part of it, but I reduced it because I didn't want it to be too long of a question. What happened yesterday? You remember in the question yesterday? We have contribution of the mass from two sources. There was a bare mass term and the Yukawa. So the mass matrix, in the, in the model yesterday, the mass matrix, there was some M plus Yukawa. That was the mass matrix, OK? And what is the coupling of the, of, the, of the Higgs? That's the mass. And the coupling of the Higgs was just Y. The Higgs coupling was just Y, OK? So when M is equal to 0 and I diagonalize Y, I diagonalize both. But in the model yesterday, when I also have some bare mass term, what's happened is that when I diagonalize the mass, I do not necessarily diagonalize Y. What I diagonalized was M plus Y. So when I diagonalize M plus Y, it doesn't guarantee that Y is diagonal, OK? So that's one example. One example is when I have bare mass term. Can you think about another example where I can break this uh, interesting case that the Yukawa and the mass are diagonal in the same basis? If I have an extra Higgs, so if I have an extra Higgs, what would happen? What would be the mass? The mass would be something like V1, Y1, plus V2, Y2. Because I have two Higgses, so I have two Vs and two Yukawas. And what will be the coupling of the Higgs? Say the coupling of H1 would be something like Y1, right? So in order to diagonalize the mass, I diagonalize this sum, where the coupling of the Higgs is only Y. And in general, they are not diagonalized in the same basis, OK? So you see that actually the fact that the Higgs coupled in the diagonal ways to the quarks is far from a trivial statement. It's not like the photon and the gluon that is guaranteed by a symmetry. It's very special. You have to make sure that all the masses in the, uh, for the quarks come from one source, which is the Higgs. Okay? It's actually this requirement of minimality. And many times when people ask, like, why you only put one Higgs in the sector, you say, it's minimal. I don't need more. If I put more, I don't need it, so I don't want it. Okay? But now we learn that actually the fact that we have only one Higgs, it's not only minimality, it's actually have important consequences. Okay? If I have more than one Higgs, I would have FCMC at three level. Good? Do we have to worry about Higgs FCMC? So let's say that I do have a model where the Higgs coupled, uh, when the Higgs coupled in a non-diagonal way. Let's take the model from yesterday. In the model from yesterday, we actually have this Higgs FCNC because it's this case, OK? And in the model yesterday, I asked you exactly those two, two things. So how do you think Higgs FCNC will affect k long to, pi to mu mu? Is it important? Is it, is it significant? Is it not? What is your feeling? Very nice. So it would be small because when I talk about k on physics, the Higgs coupling is somewhat proportional to the masses. And generically, we expect this to be suppressed by the Yukawa of, of the S or something like this. So actually, even if I have Higgs FCNC, it might be safe for the, for the k -on. But it might be more problematic for the B. And it may be much more problematic for top decays. Okay? However, in the standard model, we built it in a way that there's no Higgs FCNC. And we understand what are the ingredients. The ingredient is that we have to guarantee that there's only one source of masses, which is the Yukawa coupling. If I have two Yukawas or if I have bare mass term, this is not there anymore, and I can have FCNC. Good. So that was the Higgs. And now let's move on to, I don't want to erase it. I don't want to erase this, but I will erase it. <coughs> so the last one I want to talk is the Z. And we actually kind of mentioned it yesterday when we discussed the, the homework. And the idea that the Z is, uh, <clears throat> doesn't have FCNC is because of the following property. So I'm going to, to state the statement. 
The statement is as following, that the Z, and it's actually more general than the Z, if you do model building beyond the standard model, is correct to any neutral gauge boson. In general, gauge bosons beyond the standard model that are neutral are called Z primes, okay? So to any Z or a Z prime. Z prime is a generic name for neutral gauge bosons beyond the standard model that are heavy. So for any Z or a Z prime, there's no FCNC if the following condition happens, okay? If all, all quarks, all quarks with the same charge, with the same Q, also have the same T3, okay? Basically, let me say it a little bit more generally, I do not have flavor chain neutral kind if all the fermions in the unbroken representation belong, all the fermions that have the same representation in the unbroken group also have the same representation in the broken group, okay? That is, in the standard model, what we will find? We find that we have, say, look at the downtide quark. The downtide quark have the D, S, and B, and all of them have charge of minus a third, okay? In principle, having charge of minus a third can come from very, very different Q script Q because Q is T3 plus Y. So I could have many, many fermions that have the same Q, but they could come with different T3s. Yes, I could have Y equal 1 minus a third, and T3 is equal to 0, and I can have T3 is equal to <coughs> a minus a half, and Y is equal to a third, and I get a, a third, so, or a six, and I get a third. So what I'm saying, you see that the same Q does not guarantee that it's coming from the same T3, okay? The way we built the standard model was that we built the standard model in exact copies. So in the standard model, all the quarks with the same ch electric charge also have the same T3. Yes? What happened if we didn't? Let's say that I had quarks that are do not. For example, in the homework yesterday, I had some quarks. The S was actually had a T3 of zero, and the D has a T3 of uh, minus a half but they both have the same electric charge. And when you have two things that have different T3 and the same electric charge, pa 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 you did it, not, I want to say, three people, right? You did it, but you really, I want you to do it. It's so much fun, it's like matrices, and you diagonalize them, and you know, it, it makes you very happy. When you said, one day that you really said, do it, okay? It's, you know, you say, ah, I remember you were said, and then you'll be happy, okay? So the point is that, you do it and you see that then, in general, the Z FCNC is not diagonal, okay? You have coupling of the Z that is not diagonal and we get FCNC. So what we conclude is that when we build the standard model, people were using this trick that we say, when I have generation, all the generation must have the same, totally the same structure, okay? And when you try to add stuff to the standard model, and many times people add stuff to the standard model, such as I have the same Q but a different T3, I do have a problem. Okay? And in general, if I have it today, I have problem, and that's what you see in the lecture, in the homework yesterday. Okay? So what do we conclude? We conclude that the photon and the gluon is kind of safe. We never have FCNC with them. The Higgs and the Z are far from trivial. And you have to actually, when you do model building, you have to be very clever and very careful about how to do it. So it's far from trivial, okay? So whenever you do model building, don't forget it, okay? You have to make sure that you do those kind of things to avoid big contribution, large contribution to FCNC. <coughs> Any question on this? Nothing? Okay. Yes. So basically the fact that the gluon and the, it's basically the fact that you look at the kinetic term. So let's look at the kinetic term. The kinetic term is something like, say, u bar d slash u. And the d slash must be diagonal in the canonical basics. Not only the diagonal, the coefficient is one. So in flavor basis, d, d slash is, must be proportional to the unit matrix, right? 
And the D-slash contains both the coupling to the unbroken gauge boson and the kinet and the D-mu. So it must be diagonal because it's come from the same place where the D-mu. And the D-mu is diagonal because that's how I define my propagating state. So what I want to do next, yes. Yes. Yes, so the question is what's happening in two Higgs doublet model. And if I have two Higgs doublet model, there's no guarantee that actually the mass, the, the, the resulting coupling is programmed to the mass. Maybe there's some really cool cancellation between the two Higgs doublets, such that the coupling of each Higgs is very, very large, but their sum somehow is very, very small, okay? That could be the case. What I'm just saying is that it's not generic. I just say that in a generic case, you have to worry about it. But of course, you can actually do some tricks, and people have some, you impose some symmetries. Two Higgs doublet model is very popular, and there's a lot of kind of model building going into the case. I'm just saying that in general, you have to remember this kind of constraint. Okay, okay so what I want to do next, I want to move on to the standard model at one loop. And <clears throat> the big picture is kind of as follow. What we did so far, I was telling you about the standard model, and we built the standard model at three level. Okay? And the standard model at three level kind of give us, roughly speaking, the right things. Okay? So we talked about the rho equal one. You remember the rho equal one? And I told you, yes, it just, you measure it and it's agree. We talked about flavor chain neutral kinds. We talked about the structure of the CKM and all this. And I, we, do all, we did all these measurements and we see that this agree, okay? However, it agree only at two leading order because in the standard there's no FCNC at all at three level, but we do see some FCNC, very, very small, okay? And we kind of understand where it's coming from. It's come from one loop. And actually, also, the rho equal one relation, it's not exact. When you make me very, very precise measurement, you find that it's actually violated. It's more like 1.01, this rho equal one relation. Depend, actually, how you define it, et cetera, et cetera, OK? So the point is as following. And I want to emphasize how impressive this point is, OK? When you actually build a new model, when you think about a model of physics, at the very beginning, you can make only very rough prediction. You, your experiment results give you prediction at the point of 10, 20, 30, 40 percent, okay? And you model at three level explain all of this. And later on, you can start making more and more and more precise measurement until eventually you come to the point that you actually start being sensitive to deviation for three level. And that's really what you want. That's what physics is all about. You remember we talked about it several times. In physics, we want to actually go beyond our leading order. We want to go from three level to one loop. And what's happened in a standard model, in the 70s and, and 80s, people were at the three level level, okay? They were actually doing precision. The calculation was to get the standard model at three level. And later on, roughly speaking, we start being precise enough that we can actually start seeing deviation from three level prediction and we can actually start probing the standard model at one loop, okay? And what we found out is very, very interesting thing. So historically, when we start looking into the standard model at one loop, we start being sensitive to particles that we didn't know that they exist, okay? And historically, for example, the charm, the, the fact that we have charm, was predicted exactly before because this one was not seen. So in the 70s, people didn't see K long to mu mu, and they said, why it is? And they said, oh, there must be a charm, and if there's a charm, I understand this question. And it was rather amazing because in 1970, people predicted that the charm have a mass of 1.5 GeV, just based on going beyond three level, okay? And later on, people were able to actually predict the mass of the top, so that's come from K long, K long to mu mu, predict MC equal 1.5 GeV, and BB bar mixing. We are going to talk about it tomorrow, about BB bar mixing. BB bar mixing, when it came out, it makes the prediction that M top is equal 150 GeV. And kind of <coughs> an interesting history. So people were sure that the mass of the top is, um, <coughs> is less. 
And they were using the following really cool argument. And I'd like to present the argument to you. And I hope that you will be impressed by this argument. OK? So the argument is as following. The mass of the B is roughly 4.5 GeV. OK? The mass of the charm. Let's do the mesons. The mass of the B meson is about 5 GeV. The mass of the D meson is about 1.8 GeV. Okay? The mass of the kion is about half a GeV. Okay? I, I, I really like this argument, and I messed it up. Let me do it nicely with the big letters. B, about 5. D, about 1.8. K, about 0.5. Pi, about 0.15. OK? So you see, this is U, U and D. This is strange. This is charm. This is bottom. So do you see a pattern here? Yes? So going from here to here is about a factor of 3. Going from here to here is about a factor of 3. And going from here to here is about a factor of 3. Do you see? So what will be the mass of the top? 15 GeV. OK? So somewhere in the 80s, many people said, you know, it should be around 15 GeV. You always had the factor of 3. And people actually built colliders that tried to look for the top at 30 or 60 GeV. It's called the Tristan the Collider in Japan. And then, at 1980, people measured BB1 mixing. And using this one loop thing that I was telling you, the answer was 150, which is a factor of 10 more than what we were expecting. And many people wrote papers about why you know, this BB bar mixing result is not really correct. Maybe there's some new physics. Maybe we don't understand things. And it took people <coughs> some time until they actually accept the fact that the top may be much, much heavier than what we expect from this very naive argument. OK? So we actually measure the mass of the top was first. We kind of indirectly measured the mass of the top from BB bar mixing. And then we actually did also electroweak precision measurement. And we did electroweak precision measurement which is one loop correction to the row equal one parameters. And from this, we got m top about 150 GV, which is roughly correct, right? I mean, we measure it to be 170. So this is kind of OK. And from there, we also got that mh <coughs> have to be less than one, 150, I think, between something like this, less than 150 or 140, I think 140. And the direct search back then was above 90. So using the direct search above 90 and the electric precision, we knew that the Higgs have to be between 90 and 140. So when the LHC kind of start working, we knew that that's where the Higgs should be. Of course, we really were not sure, because maybe we don't fully understand BSM physics. But within the standard model, we knew that the Higgs should be at this point. OK? So I hope you are impressed with this thing. What we, we are doing as, as a community, that we are having precise enough, very, very precise measurement of observable that we are sensitive to one loop correction. And the one loop correction are those where we have parameters that appear from the heavy sector of the theory, like the top and the Higgs. And based on this, we are able to actually measure the parameters of the heavy sector. So we are able to measure these masses. OK? Good. So let me start with uh, we take a little detour away from flavor physics. I want to come back to the spontane symmetry breakage sector and talk a little bit about uh, how we use the one loop correction to actually learn something from the electroweak sector. And tomorrow we go back and study how we do it in flavor physics, OK? So <coughs> I want to talk about the important row equal one relation, the row equal one relation. And it's actually, there's more to this. There's a full program, and this program called Electroweak Precision Measurement. Electroweak Precision Measurement. And this program of Electroweak Precision Measurement is that you measure many, many observables that are sensitive to sinus, square, to sinus theta w, and the masses of the w, the masses of the z, all those coupling. You make many, many, many measurements. And in three level, all those, whatever, 40 measurements, it's actually 20 and something, 20 something measurements. Also, atomic part evaluation, the one that we talked about yesterday. You make all those measurements, and all of them at three level agree. But in one loop, they are different. Okay? So for example, I can 
do a one loop correction to the row equal one. So this is the one loop correction to row equal one. It will be something like this. That will be the W, and here I have like um, T and a B, and that will be the Z. And for the Z, I have here a TT or a BB. Okay? So I have one loop correction to, so this is a correction to the two point function. This is correction to the mass of the W, and this is correction to the mass of the Z. Okay? I know if you didn't do quantum field theory, this looks a little bit mysterious, but hopefully you understand when you take the propagator and you do some correction to the propagator, you get correction to the mass. Okay? So correction to the W, you have a T and a B loop because it must have a different charge. And correction to the Z, it's a TT and a BB. Okay? And the result is different. The correction to the W and the mass is different depending on because the mass of the T and the B is not the same, this diagram is different than this diagram, okay? So you see that we have deviation from rho equal one because I actually change a little bit the mass of the W and the Z. Do you see it? Okay. How large do you expect this deviation to be, roughly, order of magnitude? Yes? Yeah, times? Times, times the loop factor, okay? Good, so the mass of the top, I have to normalize it to something, so it's a dimension full. So it's the mass of the top over the mass of the W, so it's kind of order one. So it should be order one times the loop factor, so we expect it to be 1%. So people were able to actually measure the mass of the W and the Z to precision that is better than 1%, so we can start being sensitive to this correction. And we find that the correction to rho equal one is of order one percent. And you have to be a little more careful about how you actually do it, but roughly speaking, that's what we get. We get correction that are all of order one percent, okay? And <coughs> based on this, we could actually predict the mass of the top because the correction are of order one percent proportional to the mass of the top, okay? And what we find out, I'm not doing the calculation, I'm just telling you that the result is such that <clears throat> within some very crude approximation, the result is such that rho minus 1 is proportional to 1 over 16 pi squared times mt squared over mw squared, sometimes number of order 1 that I'm not writing for you. Okay? So this kind of gives you the 1%, and it's sensitive to the mass of the top. And based on this, we are able to say that the top is roughly 150 GeV, just based on the measurement or deviation of rho equal 1. So we measured the deviation from rho to 1, and we were able to get the mass of the top. OK? Does it look weird, this result, to you? Very nice. So why would you think that the first generation should have a bigger contribution than the heavy one? Because the log. There's no log. I didn't write any log. But you say, oh, there should be a log, Yuval. I cannot do a loop diagram without a log. And there are actually some loop diagrams without a log. We're going to talk about them tomorrow. But there should be a log, right? If you did any loop diagram, you know there's a log, right? But actually, this is exactly the point that I was about to, to discuss. So you should be surprised that it's actually the top and not the U, but not because there's no log. There's some bigger, deeper, reason that you should be surprised. Anybody is surprised why there's top and not you? Anybody can understand why they are surprised? <laughs> yes? Anybody? What should be our intuition? And it's based on our, there's so many ways to go around this intuition. Let me start with the intuition of second order perturbation theory. In second order perturbation theory, when I actually do some measurement of on-shell particles, what do I have to feel more? The light particles or the heavy ones? If I have a very, very heavy particle, second order perturbation theory tells me that I don't care about it because the contribution is suppressed by 1 over delta E. Another way to think about it is the propagator. Heavy propagators are suppressed by 1 over the mass of the heavy propagators. Okay? Another way to say it, it's called the decoupling theorem. The decoupling theorem states 
that if you have a particle that is very heavy, it cannot affect your physics. It's very intuitive. I really hope you, you, you have this intuition. When you go to a very, very heavy masses, they cannot affect our light spectrum. Do you see this? This is called scale separation in physics. Scale separation tells me that I don't care what's going on in the UV when I do infrared calculation. It's a very deep and important thing. Can you imagine that it wasn't like this? That I, in that I couldn't do physics. I mean, to understand the physics of this shock, I, I really don't care about the fact that this, actually these quarks make the protons inside the atoms that make the molecules that combine into making the shock. I really don't care. And that's why it's so important. Because could you imagine that we did care about the fact that quarks make the proton for this? Why I don't care? Because it's a very UV physics. When I do infrared physics, I don't care about the UV. Make sense? Do you see it from second order perturbation theory, the one over the delta E? Yes? When I have one over delta E, when, my, when, the part, when the mass of the particle is very heavy, its energy is very large, so the one over delta E goes to zero because I have one over the mass of the heavy particle. Look at the propagator. When I look at the propagator, I have one over the mass squared, so it's suppressed. Yes? And this is totally the opposite. Instead of being one of the mass of the particle, it is quadratic in the mass of the particle. Basically, if I take the mass of the top to infinity, this one diverge. Doesn't make any sense. Are you surprised now? A little bit? Surprised like, do? <gasps> Can you? OK, one of you. I want one of you should just do this. Do it for me, just one of those. Wow, how come it's empty squared? It's like, no way. I cannot believe you. There's no way it's empty squared. Like, why are you doing it to me again? OK, so what is it, OK? What, what is really going on? Anybody, do you see the puzzle? The puzzle is that somehow the sensitivity of my loop integral, instead of being suppressed by the mass of the heavy particle, is quadratic in the heavy particle. Anybody knows the answer? Yes? Thank you very much. So what she said, and let me rephrase it, but she's totally got the right answer. The intuition that <coughs> things are decoupled are, goes under this very implicit assumption that I didn't tell you is the fact that when I take the mass of the particle to infinity, I keep the coupling the same. However, this theory, the mass of the top is not a fundamental particle. The mass of the top is derived from the Yukawa interaction, right? So when I take the mass of the top to infinity, what I'm really doing, I take the Yukawa interaction to infinity. And now there's a whole different intuition. When I have a coupling and I take the coupling to infinity, then you are not surprised at all that the effect becomes large. Because when the coupling grows, also the effect grows. Okay? Now you don't really see that actually the coupling, the Yukawa coupling, enter into this diagram, but secretly it is because of the way the Higgs mechanism works, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm not going to get into this point. All I want you to understand is that because the mass of the top derives from coupling, making the mass of the top heavier, it's like making the coupling bigger. And therefore, we have sensitivity to coupling, not to mass. And therefore, actually, we expect to see an effect that grows as the coupling grows. OK? So we have this kind of two effects. We have growth of the coupling and growth of the mass. And we don't know how they play out. And they play out in a way that the growth of the coupling is more important than the growth of the mass. So we get an effect that actually grows with those things. OK? So our intuition that we just developed a few minutes ago, that it should actually disappear, is not, it's correct only in cases where the coupling, where the mass is a fundamental mass that is not related to, to coupling. So <coughs> let me just close with uh, one last remark. Yes? So, so eventually, eventually, it's all related to the Yukawa in kind of a somewhat complicated way. And if, if you have two Higgs doublet model, it will still scale like empty squared. If you have a, a model with vector light quarks that have a bare mass term, then there will be some combination here that will be a little different. So let me just uh, 
conclude. Let my, let, let, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and I will be a short answer then. Oh, Z prime? Z prime. Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's actually, here it's only G, and here there's also some G prime. Okay, so there's also both G and G prime, and therefore that's how you also get sinus to theta. I'm definitely not going to get into the details. So when G prime goes to zero, you also have the, the mass of the Z and the W become actually uh, identical. There's actually, you increase the symmetry of the theory. There's much more things going on. I'm really not going to get into it. It's a whole topic of electronic precision measurement. I just want you to hear about it and understand that it's there. And I want to conclude with the following thing, that now that we actually measure those and we know the mass of the top, we can use electronic precision correction to put bounds on higher order interaction. In particular, we can put a bound on an operator of the form h d mu h squared. And this is a dimension six operator. Everybody see that this is dimension six operator? So using this kind of things, we can put bound on dimension six operator. And since it's dimension six, I can write it like this. And assuming that all of my unknown is in this scale lambda, the current status of those electronic precision measurement is that roughly speaking, we are sensitive to lambda. We know that lambda is roughly larger than 10 TeV, OK? Which is kind of what we somewhat expect, because we, this is kind of one loop above the weak scale. So the weak scale is 100 GeV. Actually, I think I never mentioned this number, that the mass of the W and the Z is roughly 100 MeV. And one loop above them is roughly 10 TeV. So we can, everything fits nicely. We see everything agree with the standard model. And the bounds that we get from deviation from the standard model at one loop is roughly at the scale, naively, if I have new particles, this new particle has to be with a scale that is roughly bigger than 10 TeV. And I like to, to emphasize here that when you do model building and you want your particle to be detected at the LHC, you want the masses to be roughly 1 TeV. And since this one tells you that the masses have to be roughly above 10 TV, you have to be a little smart, and you have to worry, and you have to do some model building tricks in order to allow your, your new particle to be at the TV, such that they will not actually mess up with the bounds from the row equal one relation. And of course, there are some model building tricks, and I'm not going to talk much about them, and I'd be happy to talk about the, them in private. OK? So that's all I wanted to say for today, and we have one more lecture tomorrow. I hope we will actually be able to wake up in time. I will be able to make up in time, and then I will go on on, on flavor. Okay, thanks. Thank you very much.